The Mechaina clan have this interesting tendency where they completely disappear during the final battle in the third act of some films, but other than that, they're pretty cool. So we're going to talk about them. Here's my comprehensive guide to the Mechaina, also known as everyone's favorite clan. And like my comprehensive guide to the Na'vi video, this will be divided by chapters based on stuff like culture, food, rites of passage, elus, etc. The Mechaina are one of many subliteral cultures on Pandora that are living on coastal reefs, barrier reefs, or atolls. The clans that live out here are commonly referred to as reef people because you know reefs. One year after the RDA slash humans return to Pandora, Jake, Sully, and his family are forced to seek refuge amongst the Mechaina. This clan's island is number one on Jake Sully's list of places to flee because of its extremely remote location. Jake invokes Vuturu, meaning sanctuary. There is a mutual understanding between basically all the Na'vi clans where, kind of like how certain countries have obligations to take in refugees, the Na'vi clans have an obligation to take in Na'vi who could just be passing through or fleeing their home and seeking shelter. But even when presumed presented with Vuturu, the Mechaina were reluctant to take in the Sullies, mostly because Jake had a lot of baggage, like being chased by the RDA and their resurrected soldiers kind of baggage. The Coral Atolls region may have been a little bit too far for the Mechaina to be notified about helping fight against the RDA in the year 2154. Actually, you know what, wait, I find this pretty hard to believe, because the Mechaina live roughly 300 miles from the rainforest that's home to the Omatikaya settlement, and the average cruising speed of an Iklan, you know, the main means of transportation transportation for an Omatikaya warrior is 37.5 miles per hour, meaning it should only be an 8-hour flight using that mountain banshee. But of course, you have to factor in the three 1-hour stops during this trip so that the Ikran can rest every 2.6 hours in order to regain that energy. Regardless, that's like an 11 through 12-hour trip in total, so they could have easily sent like one Omatikaya Navi to go get the Mechaina. In fact, they were already at the eastern shoreline, meaning they were significantly closer than anyone in the rainforest at that point. I'm getting off topic. The point is, is that the Mechaina live in the middle of nowhere. But even though it's such an inconvenience to get out there, the Mechaina had time to learn about the story of Jake Sully and the new Turuk Makto. So Jake's reputation earns him the right for him and his family to stay at the central village of the Mechaina, a village that's named Awadalu, the same village that the clan leader and the spiritual leader do all their living. By the way, the Navi that make up the Mechaina are still considered to be the same species as the forest Navi that make up clans like the Omatikaya. Rapid Evolution adapted the Oceanic Navi to better fit their surroundings. In the book The Art of Avatar The Way of Water, James Cameron went on to talk about how they determined the physiology and the biology of the Mechaina, claiming we had to start with the design of the people themselves. It was a total aesthetic. It was functionality, not only to the eye, but true functionality, because we knew we were going to be depicting them in actual water. Therefore, how did they swim? How did they move? We had to figure that all out. And thanks to this rapid evolution, the oceanic Navi now have greener skin, so they better fit in with the color palette of the ocean reef. They still have those Bengal tiger stripe patterns on them, but the lines have evolved to be more wavy, like the water. They have paddle tails like a beaver, as well as strakes, or paddle-like extensions on their lower legs and forearms. Also, no webbed feet. No webbed feet, because in the words of James Cameron, you can't walk with webbed feet. They lost their yellow eyes, but developed either blue or green eyes, as well as gaining nictitating membranes to help them maintain perfect vision underwater. Their fingers have become more pointed, so their hands become more like arrows to help them dive into the water. When swimming through that water, their bodies move like the crocodiles we have back on Earth. I'm just gonna go ahead and make the educated guess that in the world of Avatar, the crocodiles have gone extinct as well. Let's get more specific about the mechanism an atoll. Because why not? The atoll that they're living on has a 30 mile natural ring shaped seawall protecting the villages from the wild ocean. The main village we hang out at during the way of water is located about 2 miles from said seawall. This 50 to 100 feet tall seawall that surrounds the Mechaina is believed to have been created by the great mother Ewa in order to protect and create life for their home. Within the atoll, the deepest part of the lagoon is 300 feet deep. Oh, and this is pretty cool. So along the barrier reef, you can see these terrace tide pools. These are made possible by tunnels underneath them containing a whole bunch of powerful invertebrates. And these invertebrates pump water to the top of the reef where pools of water then cascade down from said terraces. This whole process brings the Metkayuna a unique fish that they would never see because, you know, they don't go down there. The architecture of the Metkayuna villages blows my mind. In the way of water, we encounter what I call the woven city. The Metkayuna weave together all their garments, saddles for elus, the braids in their hairs, saddles for skim wings, their hammocks, 
mechanics and so on. They also weave together their entire villages. Using stripped and woven flax, they hang up their homes from the roots of mangrove trees. All of their homes, including the walkways, are supported by using tension points. The Mekaina are down with Awa, meaning they have a thing for balance, which means the Mekaina villages are perfectly balanced. The structures are strong enough to withstand storms and extreme weather, but not strong enough to harm the roots of the trees. Oh my goodness, and the freaking aesthetic of the villages, I just, I can't. As we discussed like five seconds ago, the village works with its surroundings, but the design of it goes further than that. At first, the weaving job on something as simple as like a walkway seems pretty simple and generic, right? Right? Wrong. The pattern is based on the way the light ripples through the water and lands on the ocean floor. The hammocks are weaved in a similar fashion as the walkways, but don't worry, the hammocks are made from a more softer type of material. Above their doorways, there's this semi-transparent membrane that allows the light to enter the tent. It's typically the color blue because, you know, ocean. You can see that same flax being woven in a water-like pattern over the blue right here. The shape of this window gives off the appearance of a wave because, once again, ocean. These structures have been around for thousands upon thousands of years, lasting generation after generation. The Mekaina rarely make new homes. Instead, they just maintain them or occasionally make renovations. They don't have a demand to make new homes because their population is balanced like the Omatikaya clan. Oh, and here's a nice little detail in Jake and Atiri Sully's uh, home. Above it, you can see an open totem, symbolic of the village welcoming their guests. The Mekaina and the Omatikaya share a lot of the same traditions, but the Mekaina have a different approach to basically all of them. Remember when Jake went full Lion King with Mateum? The Mekaina have a birth ceremony as well, where it's kind of like a baptism as it's considered to be a second birth. This ceremony is called First Breath. During First Breath, the entire Mekaina clan walk over to the shallow part of the lagoon where the mother of the newborn and the spiritual leader take the Navi baby and gently shove it underwater and then guide the newborn to the surface. After the Navi successfully reaches the surface, a beat is then added to their song cord. And for those who don't know what a song chord is and were suffering from confusion and anger when Jake mentioned song chords in Avatar The Way of Water, don't worry, I'm here to adequately explain it to you. Each Navi, from the moment they're born, is given the task of creating their own song chord. They pick a shell, stone, crystal, or some other naturally occurring trinket to represent an event or milestone in their life. Specifically an event or milestone that holds a lot of significance and meaning for that individual. All of the objects on their song chord make up their life song. The Omatikai or Blue Flute Clan are very music driven. So during this process, they use word selection, rhythm, and melody to create an actual song out of their song chord. A Navi from the Omatikaya will understand the significance of every object on their best friend's or family's song chord because when one of them eventually dies, their song is sung by those who are closest to them. Though it's never mentioned, I'm assuming the Metkaina do something similar. Regardless of whether or not they turn it into an actual song, each member of the Metkaina clan has a physical song chord that they often wear. On the song chord, the first breath ceremony is typically represented by using a shell in the shape of a water drum. The Metkaina tend to do these first breath ceremonies alongside their spirit brothers and sisters, also known as Tolkun, as the Tolkun and Navi from the Metkaina clan give birth around the same time. Oh yeah, the Tolkun. Prepare yourselves, everyone. It's Tolkun time. Tolkuns are modeled after the whales we have on Earth, which as you probably would assume by now, the Earth whales in the world of Avatar have gone extinct. Much like our whales, the Tolkun Tolkun are air breathers, as they inhale and exhale through their front row and back row of nostrils. They can travel up to speeds of 22 knots and can live to be 150 to 250 years old. These creatures, actually, they're too smart to be considered creatures. Scientists refer to them as an intelligent species, as no other large sea creature on Pandora compares in intelligence. For example, the Tolkun have names for each other, they also have complex language, culture, art, music, history, understanding of mathematics, and sonar capabilities. I know the last one doesn't really determine intelligence, I just think sonar capabilities is always worth mentioning. If we were to rank the sentient species on Pandora by intelligence, it would probably go Tolkun at number one, then the Navi, then the Prolimerus, and then the humans. The Tolkun have a long history of war and bloodshed and all that good stuff, but then one day they were all like, hey, you know all this killing that we're doing? Well, of course, fellow Tolkun, water, 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 you try to say. Well, this endless cycle of death really doesn't seem productive. Are you just suggesting we stop? Yeah. 
Okay. And from that moment, it's been ingrained in their culture that the Tolkun are sworn pacifists. Mind you, to make this decision as any other animal in the Pandoran food chain would be foolish. It's a freaking frenzy out there. But the Tolkun can get away with this drastic lifestyle change, mainly due to the fact that male Tolkuns are on average 93 to 263 feet long. And the female Tolkuns are anywhere between 65.5 to 230 feet long. This information tells us that they're pretty big. These creatures, I mean, sorry, intelligent species, are also equipped with heavy armor plating, so they don't really need to worry about protecting themselves against predators. Well, not until the humans enter the chat. Because of people like Ian Garvin doing research on the Tolkun, the RDA now sends setups or cetacean operations to track down and kill the Tolkun, then drill a hole in the roof of their mouths into their brains so the crew can then harvest this fluid called Amrita, a compound that literally stops the aging of humans. Just one vial of it is worth $80 million back on Earth. The Navi operate under the belief that all energy is borrowed, and that one day you have to give it back. They believe that every living thing has a soul, and that after death, their spirit goes with Awa. So humans using Amrita to stop aging is just another thing they do that completely goes against the Navi belief system. Garvin's research is funded by this very very unethical behavior. A Na'vi from the Metkayina may not necessarily pair up with the Skimwing for life. Unlike the Omatikaya, where they definitely pair up with the Mountain Banshee for life. The Metkayina do, however, pair up with the Tolkun for life, calling them their spirit brother or sister. Each home in any Metkayina village has a special hand-woven wall panel dedicated to art honoring their spirit siblings. The Metkayina also have these cute wooden toys that are modeled after their spirit brothers and sisters. Like the Tolkun, the Metkayina's history is full of conflict and hardship, so both species have chosen to live as peacefully amongst each other and their biome as they possibly can. Which is why Tonowari was so against Lawak spending time with the killer Tolkun, as the Metkayina have a similar mindset as the Tolkun philosophy. The Tolkun spend most of their time in open sea. But once a year, a large pod of Tolkun will pick a day to annually visit a lagoon that is home to Navi like the Metkayina. The Tolkun refer to this lagoon as their reef home, and this event is known as the Return Ceremony. Their spirit brothers and sisters will enter through underwater tunnels in the reef, so they can arrive directly outside of the village like a Waterloo. During the ceremony, Tolkun calves and Navi children are recognized as adults. Spirit brother and sister bonds are created, and of course, everyone else is just reunited. Oh, and for those wondering, Tolkun reproduce every two to three years. The gestation period is on average 18 months, and the Tolkun calfhood will last about 10 years. The Tolkun seeing their spirit siblings is definitely a huge bonus during this trip. But it's not the main, main reason they're returning every single year. The reason they're doing that is because of the spirit tree. Every year, the Tolkun bring their newborn calves to the Cove of the Ancestors, so that their calves can bond with the spirit tree to make their first Sahelu with the global consciousness that we know and love called Ewa. The Mekaina and Tolkun experience their children's first Ewa communions together. As you probably know by now, at the center of the Cove of the Ancestors is the spirit tree. Like the Tree of Souls, the spirit tree has this flux vortex. Both of those vortices are caused by magnetic fields paired with the properties of unobtainium. Like, a lot of unobtainium. Notice how the Tree of Souls' flux vortex is responsible for the floating mountains, while the flux vortex of the Cove of the Ancestors is responsible for floating islands. I just can't wait till we see floating volcanoes. Like the Tree of Voices or the Tree of Souls, the Mekhaina can connect to the Spirit Tree to access this global consciousness of Pandora by using Sahelu or the Bond. Doing this for the same reason is the Omatikaya, to upload and download their memories to Ewa. Unlike the Tree of Souls or the Tree of Voices, the Mekaina don't connect to vines. Instead, they bond with tendrils growing from these fronds. When the Navi from the Mekaina use the Spirit Tree to access this network, they usually have a diving partner, so there's someone there to watch over them and protect them from larger sea creatures who are wanting to get violent. Once a Navi is connected to the Spirit Tree, they don't have to worry about breathing, because the tree provides oxygen to the Navi using the bond. Sometimes the memory can be so emotionally taxing that they need their diving partner to help them return to the surface after disconnecting from the bond. The tree also adapts to its surroundings. At low tide, the tendrils and fronds are tracked, and during high tide, they expand. At the top of the tree are these filters that help the tree collect edible particles that are just floating by. Glowing zooplankton surround the tree, and these little guys are the 
aquatic equivalent of wood sprites surrounding the Tree of Voices, or the Tree of Souls. The tattoos the Mekaina are rocking do hold spiritual significance, and are considered to be gifts from Ewa. The tattoos kind of work like song chords, as each line is representative of an event on the atoll, so the placement of each line represents where that event happened. For example, the tattoos on Tonowari's face, neck, and chest are symbolic of the central island, while the tattoos on the right and left shoulders represent the seawall, protecting them from the wild ocean. The tattoos will vary depending on the role that you have in the clan. Like if you're a member of the Mekaina who frequently goes beyond the seawall, the tattoos on your arms are going to be longer, but the tattoos on your chest through head are going to be shorter, so the tattoos can help distinguish what rank you are within the clan. Oh, also, the design of each tattoo varies depending on what family you're a part of. The Mekaina don't just give each other tattoos, they also give their Tolkun brothers and sisters tattoos during the return ceremony, which is why you see Tolkun rock and tattoos. In order to become an adult or warrior, the Mekaina have to go through certain rites of passage. The final process is referred to as Ikni Maya, translation being the path to heaven. It starts with the first breath ceremony, then the first communion with Ewa, then they become a spirit brother or sister with the Tolkun. During this time, the Navi is taught the three-fingered sign language of the Mekaina, something essential for communicating underwater. When the Navi grows up a little bit more, they're given a blade. It doesn't matter if you're a warrior or not. If you're part of the Mekaina, you're given one of these puppies, as they're used for so much stuff, like hunting, cutting open fish, and cutting through aquatic vegetation, and so on. They are rarely ever used during battle, because it's not really the way of the Mekaina to really go into battle. Well, that's until Quaritch comes in the room and changes the vibe completely. Because the Mekaina are fierce warriors who would sacrifice everything to defend their home, yeah, they would definitely use these during battle. But anyway, the design of the Mekaina blade varies depending on the individual. For example, Tonowari's knife has a woven blue and brown seagrass handle, and the blade itself is made from obsidian sea stone. Renal has a similar handle, but her blade is made from aquamarine sea crystal. Sirea's blade is made from sea glass, and Aonung's blade is made from a skimwing's jawbone. Also, their spears are designed in a similar way, but it's just that the movie's not streaming yet, so I have nothing to show you. Up until this point, the soon-to-be Mekaina warrior is riding an Elu. These four-eyed, six-fin dolphins right over here. Look at them. Like the Oceanic Navi, the colors and water-like patterns on their body help them blend in with their surroundings. They have this really long neck, and the evolutionary purpose of that is when they're underwater, the pressure wave of their main body won't hit their prey before their mouth does. They also use these incredibly long necks to peek their head out of water to look for their friends, something to hunt, or just breathe air as they're being ridden. They can travel up to speeds of 32 knots, grow anywhere between 6.5 to 49 feet long, with the average size being 23 feet long, and can live up to 55 to 60 years. So in theory, a Na'vi could outlive two generations of Elu, as a healthy Na'vi can live up to 30% longer than a healthy human being. The best place to find these Elu would be in the eastern seas of Pandora. You know, the place where the Mekaina are. Young Mekaina are tasked with riding their elus around the reef and scaring away potential predators that may go after young Mekaina or elu ponies. Elus and Navi have a symbiotic relationship, and part of that relationship involves both species looking out for the other's children. So elus will protect younger Navi, and Navi will protect younger elus. Elus typically go hunting as a pack, so they can easily deter larger predators who enter the lagoon. An elu has two neural whips, like a pale, or dire horse, or most of the animals on Pandora. But like a dire horse, any Navi can make a bond with any Elu, as they are not bonded to one individual for life. And like the Mekaina spear tree, or a gill mantle, when the Navi makes the bond with an Elu, the Elu is able to supply oxygen to the rider through the bond, so that the Navi and the Elu can spend more time submerged underwater. Then when the young Mekaina is ready, they will be given the task of taming a skimwing. Skimwings are an essential part of the Mekaina way of life, as they help the Mekaina defend their home against larger predators, or, you know, help them hunt down larger predators. These 48-foot-long crocodiles have the ability to fly over water and navigate through water by swimming through it at speeds up to 50 knots. They can breathe full-time underwater, meaning they can't drown. And biologically, they're halfway between a fish and a mountain banshee, as they are the Ikran equivalent for the Mekaina. As mentioned earlier, the skimwings don't necessarily bond for life with a Navi. Which makes sense, because they only live up to like 20 years. The skimwings are extremely 
difficult to tame though, as they need a lot of bond time in order to earn their loyalty and trust. But once that trust is earned, and the Na'vi makes their bond with the Skimwing, they're ready to be considered a warrior amongst the Mechaina. When the warrior finishes their rites of passage, they receive their first tattoo, three additional beads to their song cord, as well as their own unique garment that's made from the flax found in mangrove trees, the same kind of trees that hold up their entire village. This kind of garment is designed like a safety harness, because when the rider and the skimwing start going like 50 knots underwater, it's really easy for clothing to fly off. Which is why for the Mechaina, you see the beads and trinkets on their song cords or jewelry being way more secure than something like what a forest navi would be wearing. Okay, finally, one of my favorite things to talk about food. The Mekaina follow in tradition of hunting the proper amount of fish that they would need to consume. They use every part of the animal, and only take what they need from their surroundings, keeping in tune with that sweet, sweet balance. Kind of like my recent poll on my channel- oh wait, no! Anyway, like the Omatikaya clan, the entire Mekaina clan gather during the evenings for one big communal dinner. This is where they socialize, tell stories, and strengthen the relationships within their clan. Overall, raising the morale and building a stronger community. Community. But seriously, what kind of food are we talking about here? Surprisingly, the reef people eat a lot of fish, collecting fish and putting them into these uh, closely woven bamboo fish pens so they can later smoke slash grill them. On the Mekaina menu, there's the glider fin, the hammer brow fish, not the feather tail fish because that thing doesn't taste right, and of course, the flat skate fish. The flat skate fish is more of a delicacy amongst the Mekaina. The glider fin is kind of like the salmon of Pandora, as the glider fin is absolutely a central to the ecosystem, because their one job is to basically be prey. <laughs> Which is why one glider fin can lay up to 200,000 eggs in their lifetime, you know, before meeting their inevitable demise. One of the most essential tools for hunting fish on Pandora would be this fishing spear that Lawak is seen using when the other kids bring him out to three brothers. It's an innovative tool that resembles a crossbow, and it is fantastic for hunting smaller fish underwater. When it comes to seasoning, most of the time they need to trade with other clans as they don't really have a diverse number of herbs and spices on the island. And when it comes to serving dinner, the food is served on gourds that have been cut in half, vertically, not horizontally. And the food can also be served on big ol' empty shells. It's Pandora. So... They grow shells big there. Each member of the Mekaina makes their own unique plate. Like the Omatikaya, they make their plates out of the wood of surrounding trees. Each plate is made to be held with one hand, so that they can use their other hand to eat with. Because I guess for the Mekaina and every other Na'vi clan, utensils are just out of the question. The Mekaina usually hunt large prey with skim wings, and smaller prey with the ilus or canoes. Oh, that's right! I haven't mentioned canoes yet! Guys! It's canoes! At this point, you should probably know by now that the Mekaina will stop at nothing to weave everything they possibly can. Like their canoes. Before riding an Ilu, younger members of the Mekaina will navigate through the lagoon using a one-person canoe in order to fully understand their surroundings. The older they get, the further out they're allowed to explore. They also have large canoes like this 28-foot-long outrigger canoe that fits up to four people. Those things are typically used for traveling with heavy goods and materials or during ceremonies on the water. With the help of paddles and sheer willpower, the Na'vi can get these puppies up to a max speed of 12 knots. I love that like their clothes, they decorate the bow of the vessel with trinkets. The Mekaina stick to having similar designs to each canoe, so it makes it easier for other nearby clans to identify them as Mekaina. Long story short, the canoes occasionally help with fishing. When the Mekaina need to stay underwater for long periods of time, they use the gill mantle. They attach this marine invertebrate to their back and make the bond with them like how they make a bond with an ilu. Like an ilu, the gill mantle supplies oxygen to the navi using the bond. Except the gill mantle essentially has like an infinite amount of oxygen in comparison to something like an ilu. Once bonded, the gill mantle essentially acts as an external gill for the navi, so they don't have to worry about running out of air when gathering stuff from the reef or waiting for their dive partner to finish using the spear tree. Or when you're in the mood to start channeling Awa. The oceanic navi absolutely love these things. Most of its internal organs and necessary stuff for it to function is located right here, and the rest of the body is basically one big lung. It hasn't been proven yet, but it's hypothesized by scientists that gill mantles co-evolved with the Na'vi in their symbiotic relationship, as the Na'vi look out for gill mantles the same way that they would look out for elus. The Na'vi are also able to bring the gill mantles everywhere they go, in the ocean or in the lagoon. Another sign of this co-evolution would be how the gill mantles have
have these stingers uh, kind of like a stingray. However, these stingers will not hurt a Navi as they developed an immunity to it. Quick side note, the second that I saw this thing, I was like, the Navi is looking like the rock and aquatic fairy wings. And the second thought that I had was they're going to make merch out of this and then they're going to sell the out of it at Disneyland as the creature looks like it's made to be merch. But so far, I I've seen nothing. A part of me is kind of glad that they're not making products for every possible detail in Avatar. But another part of me is kind of mad that, you know, I'm seeing a wasted opportunity here. I don't know why I'm like this. You know what we need to do? We need to talk more about Tonawari. This nine foot seven beast is the Olo Ektan or the clan leader of the Makaina. He is the definition of a fierce warrior and a natural born leader, just like a Tukan or Jake Sully. Tonoari has made sure that his clan, the Mekaina, got through times of great challenge. Times of great challenge is kind of like the times of great sorrow, but like not as intense. You can tell he's OP because he's rocking a necklace made from the teeth of an Akula, the same mega shark of a creature that almost ate Loak. Tonoari understood the risk of Vuturu, that allowing Jake and his family to stay with the clan meant trouble right here in the lagoon. And his one job involves him uh, keeping the Mekaina out of trouble, but he's also a man of honor and has respect for Turuk Makto. So needless to say, he found himself in quite the Sophie's Chow Chow. The reason Tonowari's tattoos are so centralized on his face, neck, and chest is because he's the clan leader who has to spend most of his time at the central village of the Mekaina. He often wears this ceremonial cape, which is typically worn during ceremonious occasions like ceremonies. To be more specific, it's worn during stuff like rites of passage or dance rituals, but not funerals. It's made from the nets they catch fish with, with the shells they eat from and leather from the wings of an ikran, which is interesting because they don't have banshees that far out in the atolls. So I'm assuming they got this material from trading with another clan. Let's keep it in the family and move on to eight foot seven inch Renal. Her and Tonowari are a mated pair. She acts as Sahik or spiritual leader of the Mekaina, a role that's equally as important as the clan leader, as she is the spiritual guide for the entire clan and oversees all their spiritual needs, guiding the clan through ceremonies like for first breath and funerals, but you know, those are less fun, so we're not going to talk about those as much. Like any Sahik, Renal carries a medicine pouch, as the spiritual leader is well versed in Pandora and botany, using different plants and herbs for medicinal purposes. Like how she treated Kiri after Kiri had that one seizure from being connected to the spirit tree. Renal is the most diverse Sahik I think we've ever seen, as she's also a skilled hunter, and when the situation calls for it, she's a skilled warrior, at times even going into battle while pregnant. Most of the time, she she has the shell covering the center of her forehead. This is a traditional Sahik shell that only the spiritual leader wears. Being the spiritual leader, Renal's song cord is meant to represent the entire clan, and she even incorporates it into her outfit. She also wears this shell necklace to hold the Sahik knife, the same kind of knife that Mawat takes out of her holder to stab Jake with back in the first avatar. Renal's tattoos are at the center of her head, neck, and chest, as she is an essential leader of the Mekaina, spending most of her time in the main village. Next, we go to Sireya, daughter of Renal and Tonowari. Like Neytiri being given the responsibility of guiding Jake in the ways of the Omatikaya, Sireya is tasked with guiding Nateum, Lawak, and Tuk in the ways of the Mekaina. Sireya was also supposed to teach Kiri as well, but as we discussed in my video focusing on Kiri, she can pretty much handle things on her own. Sireya is seen wearing a small shell on her head, or a bigger shell placed above her forehead, symbolic of her apprenticeship, as she is being trained by Renal to be the next Saihi of the Mekaina. So Sireya is basically an assistant at this point, learning from Renal by observing and helping during ceremonies like First Breath. And of course, like her mother, most beads and trinkets on Sireya's song cord are there to signify the people. So teaching the Sullies is really not an issue for Sireya, as she teaches the younger Mekaina how to breathe through their diaphragm, how to dive, how to hold their breath, how to communicate using the Mekaina's three-fingered sign language, and of course, how to understand the way of water. It appears that she subscribed to the whole throw them in the water water and they'll figure it out kind of method, because spending prolonged amounts of time underwater is second nature to them. Sireya has yet to receive any tattoos, as she's still in training, and she's not considered to be an adult yet. I like how she was immediately accepting of the Omatikai invaders. A huge amount of this would have to do with her very caring and patient personality. But another contributing factor would be how much she's totally crushing on Lawak. Speaking of disappointments, let's bring up Lawak's favorite person, Aonung, son of Renal and Tony 
Konowari. This 8 foot 5, 15 year old is the definition of teenage angst. Other than being a monumental disappointment, he's actually a great hunter, which is why he earned the respect of all those other kids, making him leader of the bullies. Like Siraya, he's given the responsibility of helping the Sullies adapt to their new home. But unlike Siraya, he does a terrible terrible job at it. Aonung has no tattoos and is still riding an elu because he's not yet a warrior, which is why he backs down when Mateum, who is a warrior, tells him to leave Kiri and Lawak alone. Aonung is kind of a coward, to say the least, only making fun of the Sollies behind their back or when his sister is nowhere to be seen. His adolescence is further represented right here, wearing a reef bird talon on his necklace, also known as a talon from a bird of prey. A huge contrast to the necklace his father's wearing, and on top of that, actually, you know what? I think I ran out of stuff to talk about when it comes to the Mechaina. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna gather some more information and then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna make a part two. So definitely look forward to that and I will see you guys in part two. Mm -hmm.